Do you enjoy our podcasts? Help us to be able to continue creating quality content by visiting our merch store at store.another12.org. You'll find some great merch there, and the best part about it is that a portion of every purchase goes to support the work that we do. Welcome to Drippings from the Honeycomb, the official podcast of Another 12 Ministries. We are so glad that you have decided to join us as we enjoy the sweetness of God's Word, one verse at a time. Hello and welcome to episode 12 of our journey through the book of 1 Peter. Today we're going to look at a verse that is extremely well known in the book of 1 Peter. In fact, it pretty much forms the foundation for modern apologetics. If you've ever studied apologetics in any sense or taken an apologetics course, you have interacted with this verse for sure. And the verse is 1 Peter 3.15, and it says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now, context is extremely important when you're looking at this verse because the verse is literally the middle part of a sentence. So you have to be very careful when you look at verses that constitute the middle part of a sentence because they're part of an idea that is continuing on from the verse before them and carrying through to the verse after. And because of this, we're going to actually look at the whole statement. It's important to look at the whole statement so we can better understand verse 15 in the context in which it lives in the book of first Peter. So starting in verse 13, which is actually the beginning of the statement, it says, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ. The Lord is holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So you can see that the context of this entire statement, verse 15, giving a defense for the hope, falls within the idea of suffering for doing good. And obviously we know as believers, we know from the scriptures, we know from living out our lives, maybe a little bit less in the Western world where we live, but we do understand this idea of persecution, being persecuted for serving God, being persecuted for doing what is good. Now, where I live, particularly in the United States, we're much less persecuted by the government than we are by non-believers. Although that has changed a little bit in recent days, but still the government is not barging into our church on Sunday morning and arresting people because we are worshiping God. That is still a freedom that we enjoy here in this country. But in many parts of the world, people are persecuted by the government. And so this has gone on for years and years, for centuries, millennia, People have been persecuted by both the public around them and the governments in the countries in which they live for worshiping God. And that's why Peter is bringing this up, because the believers that he's writing to in this letter are being persecuted for following God. They're being persecuted for doing what is good. And this verse, which again I said is somewhat of the foundation of modern apologetics, in my opinion has come to be somewhat misunderstood. In my own experience, this verse has definitely become a banner for offensive aggression against those who do not believe. And I think that is not at all what Peter is saying here. I don't see that anywhere in the scripture here that Peter is writing. While we need to be aware and able to defend our faith in Christ, the whole thing is not based on aggressive defense or aggressive offense. Peter's idea is, Look, you're going to be persecuted at times for being a believer. That's just a reality. And he would go on to talk about how Christ himself was crucified. He's talked about it earlier and he's going to talk about it again. And Christ lived the ultimate life of good. He was perfect and yet he was still persecuted for living out a life marked by total righteousness. So we should not expect being Christ followers 
to escape from this. We're going to be persecuted. Jesus himself said that if they persecuted him, they would persecute us. So persecution is something that every believer should expect to see in their life. And Peter is trying to explain to these Christians that are being persecuted in his churches that this is an opportunity for sharing the gospel. This is an opportunity for those around you, even your persecutors, to mark the fact that you suffer differently. To mark the fact that for you, suffering can be endured with joy because you are partaking in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. For the believer, there's a hope. There's something bigger, something better, something beyond this world that allows them to rejoice through suffering. And it's easy to read this verse and say, I must always be prepared to make a defense and become very militaristic about that. To read all this literature, to study apologetics, which is a marvelous pursuit. I am not at all saying that studying apologetics is a bad pursuit. In fact, it's a pursuit I think every Christian should undertake. To learn apologetics, to learn how to give a hope, to defend the gospel. It's a wonderful pursuit. But the main focal point of this passage does not stop at defending the gospel. If Peter had said, always be prepared to make a defense of the gospel per se, then it would be a different conversation, but that's not what he says. He says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Peter is presuming the fact that believers who know that their eternal reward waits outside of this earth, that the suffering they're going through here pales in comparison to the reward that they will have in heaven, he knows that those believers will be filled with hope. And his point is, when the world sees the hope that you're filled with, you need to be able to give them a reason why. You need to be able to tell them why you have this hope. This is an opportunity to spread the kingdom of God by sharing the gospel. Don't miss this. Peter is encouraging his churches to use suffering as a tool for evangelism, to share with those who are outside of the kingdom of God, who are outside of the church here in this context of this letter, the whole basis for why they have joy in spite of their suffering. This is not a call to take up swords and defend God from some evil people who are trying to tear down the name of God. Believe me, if God wants to defend himself, he is perfectly capable of doing so. He does not need our feeble attempts to protect him. We're not protecting the scripture. We're not protecting God. We're not defending Jesus Christ. God and his word stand forever. He doesn't need our protection. He doesn't need us to be on guard to defend against enemies that would hurt him. He is not hurtable in that sense. He cannot be assailed. What we are defending is the hope that we have. What we are defending is that faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ, is something that is engaged in by minds that are functioning correctly, that are made in the image of God. We are not insane people. We are not believing in some fairy tale. We have sound evidence through the scriptures, through the historical record, through the eyewitness testimonies left for us throughout the history, through the books written by men and women who have loved and served God and suffered and died for his work throughout the last 2,000 years. We have a firm foundation on which our faith rests. We don't believe in simple fairy tales. And that's what Peter wants to get through to these churches. Look, when you don't react the way normal persecuted people react, you're going to create a lot of questioning in the surrounding society. Rulers persecuting you are going to want to know why you're still glad, why you're still hopeful. People who persecute you are going to want to know why their persecution doesn't destroy your joy. You need to be able to give them that answer because that is the whole point. And if you look throughout the book of Acts, this theme is played over and over and over again. Peter and John and the other disciples leave prison after being beaten at the orders of the priests. They leave joyfully. Paul and Silas are chained in the prison and they're singing hymns. 
the bottom line is that persecuted believers in the scriptures endured persecution with joy. They looked at it as an opportunity to share in the sufferings of Jesus and also to live out a witness before the society around them. And they used these experiences of suffering to promote the gospel. Perhaps no passage of scripture better illustrates this than the first chapter of Philippians, which Paul is writing to the church at Philippi while he's literally chained to a Roman guard awaiting trial, which is going to result in execution. And in verse 12 of the first chapter of Philippians, Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. There's that theme again, the defense of the gospel. But you have to understand by looking at the first couple of verses of this, this is what Paul is saying. Hey, you know what? The guards who are chained to me, they can't go anywhere. This is a perfect opportunity to share the gospel with them. They have to stay here. They have to listen to me because they're chained to me. They're guarding me. And it wasn't that Paul just talked their ear off. Paul's sitting here writing huge sections of what would ultimately become the New Testament. They're seeing Paul's fervor, Paul's commitment to the calling of Jesus Christ. And you can be certain that they had questions. And how do we know they had questions? We know they had questions because when Paul is being transported to Rome, the book of Acts records that the centurion was so intrigued by Paul's life that he actually began to trust him implicitly to the point that when they're shipwrecked on Malta and Paul tells the Roman centurion, that he has had a vision that God has sent an angel to him to tell him that he is going to spare the lives of everyone on the ship, but everyone has to stay on the ship. The centurion trusts him so much that he has his men cut away the life draft that the sailors lower into the water. So you know that these men had questions. They were listening to Paul, talking to Paul, watching him live his life through this difficult trial that he was in, and they had questions, and the Apostle Paul didn't miss a beat. He gave the gospel to the whole imperial guard. That's what it says in verse 13. It's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest. You couldn't be around Paul without watching him suffer with joy and then hearing him give you a defense for his hope. And Peter here is instructing the Christians in his churches to do the exact same thing to defend the hope that they have. So naturally, this verse spawns some questions in our own life. First of all, what hope is Peter talking about? Well, he's talking about eternal hope. He's talking about the idea of being with Jesus. He's talking about the fact that this life is not where our hope as believers is centered. See, we are not made for this world. This world is dying. Our bodies are dying. Everything here is under the curse of sin. That is not our ultimate destiny. It's not our ultimate purpose. We were created to be eternal beings that live forever in a perfected world in full fellowship with God, living with him, serving him, and living out these lives filled with joy, purpose, meaning, fulfillment, and energy forever. And that's what we're going to ultimately end up in, this incredible new universe that God is going to create when he returns, and he's going to take us all to be with him, and he's going to bring his city down from heaven to the earth to dwell on the earth with man, and we're going to be these people who constitute the inheritance of Jesus Christ. This future is glorious. This future is incredible. There is nothing on earth that can even remotely compare to what is going to occur in the new world when Jesus comes back and remakes the universe. And because of that, the believer is filled with hope. That's the hope that Peter's talking about. The defense that Peter's talking about is the same defense that Paul talks about in Philippians. The gospel spreads through hope. When people see you acting in a way that is reverse of the way humans think, remember, 
Oftentimes we refer to the kingdom of Jesus as the upside down kingdom. There's a reason for that. The way that Jesus' kingdom works flies in the face of everything that fallen man knows and does. Fallen man is unhappy and upset and angry in the face of persecution and suffering. The believer is joyful in the face of suffering because he knows that he is being perfected by the sanctification of God for the next world. So the gospel spreads through hope because when sinful people see the joy that the believer has in the future hope, they are filled with questions and they want to know. And the believer that is prepared gives a defense for this hope and that defense is the gospel. Now, people without hope cannot spread good news. People who don't have a hope for the future are incapable of spreading hope for the future. They themselves don't have it. They cannot give it to anyone. They cannot share it with anyone. If you don't have a hope about your future in Christ, then you're not going to give any hope. We talk a lot about sharing the gospel in our churches, sharing the gospel in our small groups, our youth groups. We encourage one another to go out and witness to other people. But if we don't have a hope, of our future in being united with God in the new earth, then we're not going to be effective defenders of that hope because we ourselves don't possess it. If you see the church struggling to share the gospel, it's because the church lacks vision. It lacks the hope of being with its Savior. You must have confidence in the hope of being with Jesus in order to effectively spread that hope through the gospel, to the nations. Look at the people who are the most effective at bringing the gospel to other people, and you will see that they have a tremendous desire to be with God. They have this tremendous hope built up that when they die, they will be with Jesus. Again, this idea is echoed beautifully by the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of Philippians when he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means faithful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. This is the idea. This is the hope that Peter's talking about. Paul is so torn. I want to stay here because I want to help the churches that I planted and I love doing ministry and I know that when I die and I go and be with the Lord, ministry is over for me. That's it. It's done. I won't ever be giving the gospel to those who need to hear the gospel. And so the labor of serving his Savior by sharing the gospel was so sweet to Paul that he was torn between staying on earth and serving God and giving the gospel to those who needed to hear it and being killed at the hand of Caesar and going to be with the Lord, which was better. He acknowledges that's better, but I'm torn because I love serving God on this earth too. See, this is the kind of hope that demands an answer. This is the kind of hope that causes non-believers to say, your hope is so foreign to me, I need an explanation from you. I need to understand why you have this kind of hope. And that opens doors for evangelism. That kind of hope throws the doors wide open and opens opportunities for believers to, as Peter says it, make a defense of the hope that is within us. There is a famous quote that goes something like this. It says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. I would submit to you that based on the words of Peter and Paul in the scriptures, this quote actually misses the mark. The quote would be better said, live your life in such a way that you will have no option but to use words. In other words, live your life with so much hope in the promises of God and in the hope that is set before you as a believer that you will have no end of giving a defense to those around you of why you believe what you believe because it so radically impacts the way you live your life. Living out a witness for God is absolutely crucial. The scriptures confirm this. The whole New Testament is full of the apostles talking about living out a life that 
is a testimony before everyone around you. But you know how you'll know that you're doing that? Everyone around you will want to know why your life looks so different. And you will not be able to effectively accomplish this unless your life is completely filled with the hope of being with your Savior. Because then, everything that you do, everything that you say, every situation that you face, you will face with the joy and the hope of your future. And that will prompt those around you to ask a lot of questions and give you the opportunity to defend your hope. So with all this in mind, we're left with one final question. Do I have the kind of hope in my eternal future that impacts the way I live my life so that I am forced to make a defense of the hope that is within me to a watching world? I hope you enjoyed this episode of Drippings from the Honeycomb. If you would like to learn more about Another 12 Ministries and the work that we are doing to train ministry leaders to bring the gospel to all people, visit another12.org. If you would like to support our ministry, click on the donate link in the description below.